<laughs> you with my hand, you see. I can see. Um, <laughs> and the the stick thing is like uh, the shape of a toothbrush, but it has the floss on the end of it. Mm, oh, right. I know what if you, you mean, know, you yeah. know what I mean. So um, that's yeah. extremely effective for people with small mouth and big hands. Okay, thank you. Mm. It is a, it is cumbersome, though, isn't it? Flossing to do it properly. That's part of the problem, obviously. Really? Anyway. I mean, really? That's it's when you have to wind to it around your finger and it's difficult to run a marathon. Flossing is nothing. Just stick it in your mouth. You do it in the shower. How yeah. about how about birth? Australian woman gives birth at 63. Oh, Her God. partner is 78. The couple being criticised as irresponsible. That's the story in a nutshell. What is the age of irresponsibility here, in your opinion? Is 63 too old? I think it's pretty dangerous to have an opinion on something like that. I mean, clearly nature determines what is too old, literally, uh, unless uh, they've done it other than through natural means. But um, all I can say is that um, as somebody who is a grandparent to young children, you know, goodness gracious me, you know, having them at an age of, you know, 40 or 50 or over would be extremely tiring. Yeah, can you imagine? So this Australian woman did have to travel overseas for the IVF that resulted in the child. And I just think it will be difficult when, you know, the child is 20 and she's 82. But, I mean, irresponsible is a 16-year-old having a baby as well. So, you know, each At to the their other own. end of the spectrum. Yeah, if they're great parents and they love the baby, then I'm not going to judge. The Wee Girls, the couple's first child, they'd tried and tried to have one. Monash University professor Gabe Kovac says the end of natural pregnancy for a woman is 53 and to help anyone older than that have a baby naturally is irresponsible. That is what is being said. But you've already given your opinion about that. I'll ask you something else. David Cameron, uh, there's been a, well, a minor development on this today. You know, the row he provoked in Britain after being accused of devaluing the honours system by a rewarding his colleagues and his wife Samantha's stylist in his resignation honours list and he had already given his own hairdresser an MBE for services to hairdressing. <laughs> he's got a nice haircut. He does actually. And That's he's a probably good... quite demanding. And the so you think it was justified? The hairdresser probably <laughs> runs the country because the hairdressers basically do chat to him for an hour a week or whatever yeah. it is and probably share yeah. their view so probably well deserved. Actually, way. you're, you're right, actually. Going. That's how you know that um, Donald Trump doesn't have any gay friends because they would have fixed that hair in a heartbeat. Unbelievable. If he had any. Mm. Yeah. The other point today is that the, the development on this big story is that Isabel Spearman, the stylist, whose photograph has been splashed all over the tabloids, is being supported by female columnists now who say, why is her photo being used uh, across media when other gongs have been given to Mr Cameron's male buddies as well? but there are no photographs of them. Do you have sympathy with that view? Yes. Yes. I mean, it is a, a, sorry. It's a rhetorical question. Lisa, you go. I just wondered, is she attractive? I mean, you know, conventionally, because <laughs> that's how the algorithm works, isn't it? You know, attractive woman beats, um, you know, balding, fat, old, you know, cronies any day as far as the newspapers are concerned. But, the, right. I mean, the whole thing is an old boys club. I mean, why why do politicians and, um, you know, people who work in business happen to get uh, awards and honours? You know, you know who I think should get awards and honours are the people on Sunday's Good Sorts, you know, the people in the community who are out there actually helping people and making a difference, not somebody who just happens to have been successful and made a whole heap of money along the way. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people have sympathy with that view. So do you think the currency's already devalued both well no it's not it can't be devalued if good people still keep getting mbes and you know qsms and things but is it all to an extent devalued both here and, and overseas to some extent i mean obviously good people do get them but if you look through the lists i mean a lot of these people just happen to have been either in public service for a very long time or in business for a very long time but what difference have they actually made is what i would want to know very good what people are talking about just before you go is flossing <laughs> and an awful number of people are members of your flossing fraternity susan hornsby gallic a lot of flossers out there excellent all extolling its virtues <laughs> uh, very nice to have you on the panel today nice to chat too and lisa scott you too thank you nice to talk to you susan yeah you too thanks everybody we're back tomorrow and checkpoint with john campbell follows
Kia ora everyone, I'm John Campbell on behalf of our excellent team. Hari mai, welcome to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Tō te maira i hoa he korero, kei te hairi, he kaupapa kei te karawhiua. Tonight, five Tongan workers dead in the Bay of Plenty. We talked to the people they lived amongst, their friends and family, the Tongan Prime Minister and their Kiwi boss. With just three days to go until the start of the Rio Olympics, officials bring in a 600-strong emergency crew to try to get the village up to scratch. It's winter, but it's still too dry in Canterbury and more serious water restrictions loom for farmers. Reckon your pay rise was meagre this year and last year and the year before that? Well, official figures back you up. Victor Vito on the Super Rugby Final, which also happens to be his 100th and final game for the Hurricanes. And the Australian woman with a giant sinkhole in her backyard. All that and more in the next 89 minutes. But first, Katrina Batten with the latest RNZ News. Kia ora, good evening. The Transport Agency is rejecting criticism. It's been too slow to fix a stretch of road where five men were killed in a crash last night. Five Tongan workers from a Katikati call store died when their vehicle was hit side on by a logging truck last night as they were pulling out onto State Highway 2. Katikati residents say they've been battling for years to have the road made safer. The Transport Agency's Tauranga Highway Manager, Nick Johansson, says it's the third most dangerous stretch of road in the country, but millions have already been spent on improvements. I am equally frustrated. I have lived up that road and I have family and friends living up that road and travel on it all the time. But there are a lot of competing interests and it is a very tricky section of road to quickly make improvements on. Nick Johansson of the Transport Agency. The police say it's too soon to say what caused the crash. The jury in the rape trial of professional cricketer Scott Kugeline has been unable to reach a verdict and it's expected a new trial will be held. Scott Kugeline was accused of raping a 21-year-old woman in May last year. Andrew McRae reports. The trial started at the beginning of last week in the Hamilton District Court and the jury retired at 11.30 yesterday. Earlier today they came back with a question then just after 2 o'clock they returned to court telling the judge they would not be able to reach a unanimous or a majority verdict. Judge Philip Connell dismissed the jury and thanked them for their service. He says the jury had spent a good time considering the case and had been very careful in their deliberations. Scott Kugelein has been remanded on bail until next month when a retrial date is expected to be set. Core Andrew McRae-Tene. The Crown says three people managed to feed and look after themselves while they left an elderly woman to starve to death in her bedroom. The prosecutor has summed up the case against Cindy Taylor, who's accused of the manslaughter of her mother, Ina Dung, by failing to provide her with food, water and medical attention. Cindy Taylor's flatmates, Luana and Brian Taylor, are charged with failing to get Ms Dung help, despite knowing she was in danger. The prosecutor told the court there was food in the cupboards and fridge, but Ms Dong was left with broken ribs, chemical burns from her own waist and ulcers, which were turning gangrenous. Wage growth has remained subdued. Official figures show the labour cost index, which reflects changes in pay rates, rose 0.4% in the three months to June and 1.5% for the year. Statistics New Zealand says annual increases have ranged between 1.5 and 1.8% over the past three years. A senior economist at ASB, Jane Turner, says a subdued labour market adds to the case for lower interest rates. Wage inflation was slightly weaker than the market was expecting and for the Reserve Bank of New Zealand this really reinforces the downside risks to their inflation outlook and reinforces the case for further OCR cuts. Jane Turner expects the Reserve Bank to cut rates twice more with the first one next week. A prominent Māori leader has gone on trial in Wellington facing charges of fraud and corruption. Sir Ngātata Love, the former head of the Wellington Tents Trust, is before the High Court accused of fraudulently receiving almost $2 million for development of the Trust's land. The prosecutor Grant Burston told the court the defendant arranged for his partner to liaise with the developers and an agreement was signed under which they would pay her $1.5 million plus GST. He said Sir Ngātata Tata tried to keep those dealings secret as shown by his actions when a letter from the developer's lawyers was inadvertently sent to the lawyer for the Tents Trust. Dr Love contacted the solicitor concerned saying that the services agreement was not to be released and it was confidential. 
He was upset and annoyed that it had been released. Prosecutor Grant Burston. The Dental Association is reviewing its guidelines after the US dropped its recommendation people floss every day. The latest guidelines from the US Departments of Agriculture and Health have dropped any mention of flossing. The Dental Association spokesman Warwick Duncan, a professor at Otago University's dental school, says the change appears to be in response to a report which found the existing evidence for flossing is weak. It's not uncommon in most areas of medicine, including dentistry, to find that the older research uh, is criticised um, as being um, too small, not enough people in it, um, not long enough, quite often funded by industry, so potentially biased, various things that create flaws. Warwick Duncan says although the Dental Association is reviewing its guidelines, it recommends people floss, continue flossing. In sport, Australian code hopper Jared Hayne will line up against the New Zealand Warriors this Sunday after signing on with the Gold Coast Titans in the NRL. Hayne hasn't played rugby league since his departure from the Parramatta Eels at the end of 2014 to pursue a career in American football. He switched codes again earlier this year when he tried to make the Fijian Sevens Olympic team but wasn't successful. Hayne's two-year deal with the Titans is reportedly worth $1.3 million a season. The New Zealand women's hockey coach Mark Hager says the Olympic turf in Rio is one of the best he's seen. The Black Sticks played Japan in a warm-up game yesterday and meet the USA in their final friendly tomorrow. Hager says the turf is excellent. It plays flat and true, it's fast. The penalty corner, the setup around there, I think uh, you'll see a lot of penalty corner goals scored this, this tournament because of just how fast it is around that area and all the drag flickers and the hitters are commenting how pleasant it is to be uh, on that pitch and how easy it is to, to actually get execute your skills on that pitch as well. Black Six coach Mark Hager. The Court of Arbitration for Sport has rejected an appeal by 17 Russian rowers who are attempting to overturn their ban from the Rio Olympics. Last week, rowing's governing body banned 17 rowers and two coxes after ruling they didn't meet the IOC's new criteria of being regularly drug tested outside Russia. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Claire Austin wants a conversation on conversing about cancer especially when at least one of the participants has the disease. After all, nobody wants to get hurt. The question is, who's the most vulnerable one in the dialogue? And this week's overseas correspondent, Johnny Blades, has a tale of two uninhabited Pacific islands, Tinian and Pagan, that the US wants to play war games on. That's on nights, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow and there are snow warnings in force for some parts of the South Island. In the west from Northland to Wellington, including Coromandel and the central high country, showers turning to rain at times with some heavy falls, snow lowering to 700 metres about the central high country tomorrow. Bay of Plenty showers, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa. Rain at times, snow lowering to 600 metres in the south tomorrow. Nelson and Buller, showers and snow lowering to 500 metres, clearing tomorrow. Westland and Fiordland, showers with snow lowering to low levels in the south, clearing tonight. Marlborough, Canterbury, Otago and Southland, rain south of Christchurch, spreading north overnight, falling as snow to low levels, gradually easing tomorrow and clearing from inland areas of Otago and Southland. And the Chatham Islands, rain at times. It's nine minutes past five. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. The Bay of Plenty town of Katikati is in shock, of course, and in Tonga, entire communities are in mourning. After five Tongan seasonal workers, including a father and son, were killed in that crash on State Highway 2 last night. The Kiwi Fruit Call Store workers were on their way home from work when their vehicle was hit by a logging truck as they were pulling out of a side road from their workplace. Normally they travelled home in a work van or a bus, but we understand one of them had a car and offered a lift to some of his mates. As Sharon Brett Kelly reports, the accident happened on the country's third most dangerous stretch of road. Friends and co-workers of the five men gathered at Aonga Teti Call Store today to comfort each other, sharing food and songs. Church elder Simeone Vakasiola was one of the firefighters called to the crash last night and struggles to describe the scene where five men he knew well were dead. I can't get the picture in my head at the moment, but it was a very, very sad thing to look at. Um, I mean, you're looking at five people you know died. 
He had to leave it to his colleagues to free the bodies. It is my job to pull them out, a job that I didn't want to do it last night. I do get them out of the car because I just can't have the brave enough to get in there and, and, and cut them out. One of the men, Halani Fine, lived with Mr Vakasiola in Katikati. He had moved there from Auckland to study as a youth worker and worked at the call store for extra money. The other four men were from Tonga Tapu. Tonga's seasonal workers coordinator, Sefiti Haoli, says almost everyone in Katikati's small Tongan community is related to the victims. One of the, the senior members of the, uh, this group has been here since 2007 and of course there's a father and son and the other two are related also by marriage. Many of the, of the workers who make up this group are closely related. Katikati Community Board Chairman Sam Dunlop says everyone in the town of 5,000 has been touched by the tragedy. The Tongan community reach right out into the Katikati community in a whole lot of different ways. And everybody will know family of those young men. One of the young men, Samuela Toka Telata, had picked avocados for him. Lovely young man. Friendly, worked hard, great. Gone. Uh, you know, you, you ask the question, I mean, how's his family feeling? I know. I think I might know how they're feeling because it'll be how I'm feeling only a lot worse. Sam Dunlop says the community will raise funds to help send family members back to Tonga with the bodies. The police are investigating the cause of the crash, but say it happened on an unforgiving stretch of road with a history of fatal accidents. Western Bay of Plenty councillor Don Thwaites has lived on the stretch of road for 42 years. He says Katikati residents have complained for years about the dangerous road. We've just seen countless accidents. There's been eight fatalities and six separate incidents, two kilometres either side of my road in the Tipuna in the last five years alone. There's been multiple fatalities. The four ladies who sadly lost their lives just short of that last night's accident and that Apple Curves crash. So it's just been an ongoing um, battle to get improvements on the road. The Transport Agency says the site of the crash is on the third riskiest stretch of road in the country and several millions of dollars have already been spent on making it safer. But the General Manager of State Highways and Network Operations, Nick Johansson, says he does not agree that the agency has been slow to fix the problems. I am equally frustrated. I have lived up that road and I have family and friends living up that road and travel on it all the time and I you know I look all the time um, what we can do to make it safer but there are a lot of competing interests and it is a very tricky section of road to quickly make improvements on. Nick Johansson says half a billion dollars will be spent on the highway between Tauranga and Waihi in coming years including 83 million on making it safer. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi ko Sharon Brett Kelly tēnei. Alan Dawson is the owner of the Kiwi Fruit Call Store. Tongan seasonal workers are central uh, to his business. One of the workers, Ula Opini Vaipulu, had been uh, returning there to work for eight years now, but more than that, the business was at the heart of a uniquely Tongan Kiwi community. And today the business is closed, but the doors are open, so everyone who's part of that community can simply come and mourn. What we've done is to um, close the operations from the pack house and open it up for everybody to, to meet and come in and uh, and and more or less grieve together. Um, some of the ladies are providing food and soup and so on, and there's um, counsellors uh, have come to to take part in in that process. And the Tongan Church from Kati Kati, those people are coming. Um, there's just a tremendous outpouring of support from. All around the community, and uh, and all around the greater um, post harvest community of kiwi fruit uh, people that we're associated with. Alan, the thing uh, is about uh, seasonal workers is that it's not that there's nothing uh, typical about that. These are people who've travelled to work with you, who eat together, who stay together, who work together, and so it's not like a normal workplace, is it? It becomes 
like a family because of the unusual circumstance which brings everyone together and kind of holds them together 24 hours a day. And, and it very much yeah, it does. It does that exactly. And um, we, um, although they are the RSE workers and they're only able to stay in the country for seven months of each year, um, one of these uh, guys was uh, eight, his eighth year with us. Hmm. And um, so, and he's uh, had his son for the last two years here as well. And and and, and, that, and they are both lost, and it yeah. it's such a terrible thing. And the fact that someone chose to come back to you for eight years, and you chose to have him back for eight years, speaks volumes about the the relationship and about a mutual respect, I guess. Oh, absolutely. And um, he was. He wasn't just a worker; he was a skilled person, and um, he he had a supervisory role here, and he um, really ran our uh, tray strapping process and liaised with the tray makers. And um, one of the things that's going to hit us is that all the Tongan people will be going back to Tonga to be with um, these people, to be with their friends and family. And uh, so we <clears throat> we not only lose these five people, but the uh, other 20 or so that are working here will be going back to Tonga with them. So it's, um, and that's why other facilities have offered us support as well, because they realise that's, the part of the process. It's such a disaster on every level, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, this is obviously the most tragic thing to lose five people in these circumstances and so avoidable and so sudden and so terrible. And then over and above that, you're talking about five people who are lost, 20 people who are going to lose their incomes because they're going to go home and yeah. the communities they're from really rely on their wages because nearly all of that money goes home. So, And then, of course, the impact of that on you. So at every level, this is just terrible, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually, and uh, well, we feel <clears throat> even more more for the for the people themselves and the Tongans and the Tongan community. And when we take on RSEs, we we do have a, a pastoral responsibility as part of that um, taking them on, and we take that pretty seriously. So we um, are always at pains to to look after them just outside the workplace as well, and and to perhaps give them some good experience of New Zealand. And my wife, Nell, is, is our operations manager, and she's working with these people in the pack house on a daily basis as well. Mm. So, um, but everywhere I move around the operation today, um, it's just affected so many of our staff, the, the they're all involved in various ways, you know, and so it's uh, it, it's just uh, it, it's tremendous um, tragedy and and the the outpouring of support and grief from everybody is sort of reassuring but humbling and and all in the same way. Um, so that's that's where we are. Alan Dawson, the owner of the Kiwi Fruit Call store that the men worked at. Later in Checkpoint, we'll talk to an elder at the church the men attended who also happened to be a volunteer firefighter who arrived at the scene to discover uh, the crash last night. The Tonga Prime Minister, Akilisi Pohiva, is visiting New Zealand. A short time ago, Radio New Zealand International's reporter Alex Perite asked him about the families back in Tonga and his concern about their financial position now find out whether there was a or there is a uh, life insurance uh, you know uh, of these uh, family members um, but before uh, they are you know um, uh, taken on plane to Tonga uh, we have the support here we expect the support here of the families 
and also the support of the Tongan Consulate here in Auckland. And also uh, we have here in Auckland an agent, Tongan agent, who, look, 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 who is looking after uh, you know, these people. And Prime Minister, you're planning on, on oh, visiting he's, tomorrow. He's the one who is implementing the... And, and sorry, you yourself will be visiting oh, hopefully I'll, tomorrow. I'll be there. To, I'll visit to uh, Karikati tomorrow to, you know, to meet the fam members of the family. The Tonga Prime Minister confirming he will be going to the site of the crash tomorrow. It's 20 minutes past five on Checkpoint. If you've been told by your boss in the past few months that your annual pay rise barely warrants the use of the word rise, you're not alone. Official figures have revealed the average annual wage increase in the year to June was 1.5%, meaning increases have now been below 2% for the past four years. While inflation remains low, with costs like rents, rates, electricity bills and so on showing no signs of abating, unions say struggling staff are increasingly considering strike action to get a more meaningful kind of increase. Our economics correspondent Patrick O'Mara reports. The economy is growing at about 25 to 3% a year, but the Assistant Secretary at Unite Union, Tom Buckley, says wages are failing to keep up with growth. This year we've seen wage settlements coming in around sort of, you know, 3 to 2%, but over the last couple of months we've seen employers actually pushing wages down to sort of quite low amounts where members are really unhappy. Unite represents workers employed by a wide range of companies, hotels, casinos, fast food chains, call centres and security firms. Mr Buckley says in most cases, employers can pay more but won't. Where this is happening, I think on many occasions we've seen an increasing amount of it. Workers are um, wanting more and they're actually prepared to um, take the step to industrial action where needed to ensure that the wage increases can improve. Tom Buckley says there have been two separate strike votes by Unite workers in the last couple of weeks because their employers' offers were not enough. The Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills and Employment, Stephen Joyce, maintains that households are better off because their purchasing power has improved due to lower inflation. We have to look at real wages and the purchasing power and uh, certainly in terms of increased dollars in the pocket and also we've got food prices very flat, we've got transport prices falling, uh, telecommunications prices falling and so on and those are real positives for people's cost of living. But Tom Buckley says it's not as simple as that. He says the rising cost of housing takes a big chunk out of pay packets, particularly for low income workers in Auckland. We're also facing a crisis of housing which is Simply, uh, the response needs to be pay, pay more for people to better afford the housing costs that they're confronted with. And ASB senior economist Jane Turner warns that a prolonged period of low wages can work against the economy. The softer labour market often reduces turnover and makes people a little bit more cautious in their outlook and they're less willing to perhaps invest in uh, key big ticket items and that in turn suppresses the economy. So the Reserve Bank will be wanting to see a tighter labour market and a bit of a lift coming through over the coming year. But not all workers are finding it difficult. The Chief Executive of the Registered Master Builders Association, David Kelly, says skilled staff are in short supply in the booming construction sector. Certainly there are a number of the higher skilled jobs where there is a shortage and where there's definitely pressure, upward pressure on wages. Uh, so if I think about roles like project management and quantity surveying or the skilled tradespeople with experience. Skilled staff are also in demand to fill professional finance, accounting and technology roles. And becoming a politician does have its benefits. They enjoyed a 4% pay rise last year. For Checkpoint... Patrick O'Mara. Twenty-four minutes past five on Checkpoint. Coming up, the government does a U-turn on its decision not to fund safe sleep programs for newborns. Olympic kayaker Mike Dawson hits the streets of Rio to feed children. We're going to hear more about the Olympic Village too and much more coming up before six o'clock. We'd love to hear from you in any way you choose. You can text us on 2101. And if you were part of New Zealand's large Tongan community and you knew some of those men who died at Katikati, we would love to hear from you also email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz and don't forget um, of course our Facebook and Twitter pages. As a southerly front belatedly delivers much of the country some winter, Canterbury farmers are facing water restrictions, significant rainfall 
is needed. A drought report released by the Canterbury Regional Council today states that almost 90% of the region's bores are at very low levels. And remember, that's in July, August. The council says conditions are the worst in 30 years. If they continue, water levels could fall so low, irrigators simply won't be able to operate come summer. Sally Murphy reports. There were patches of rain across Canterbury this morning, but for farmers, it's not enough. The Canterbury Regional Council Chief Executive Bill Bayfield says it's hard for people to realise the extent of the problem when there has been rain. 86% of our wells in Canterbury are at the moment showing either low or very low groundwater levels and that is really significant. If we don't get a lot of rain in the remainder of this winter and an early spring, that will be the third winter in a row in which recharge to Canterbury's groundwater has been effectively minimal. Mr Bayfield says if significant rain doesn't fall, farmers using surface water and water from rivers will probably face restrictions or even bans on irrigation. The August forecast is not looking great for us and really by if we get a decent October we'll be into an irrigation season. Tony Daverin, a, a scientist, has just put it very well uh, when he said that some groundwater pumps could be pumping air. North Canterbury farmer Mike Bowler's grass levels are so low that he's been forced to send more than a thousand ewes and hoggets to other farms to feed. Mr Bowler says rain which has fallen over the last few months has not made a difference. The top two inches are damp but that is all. So are you seeing much growth? Not now we're not. We were up until 10 days ago. We were very warm mild winter. We've actually had hard frost since and um, we're not getting any growth at all now. Mr Bowler doesn't use irrigation on his farm, instead he relies on snow melt, but hardly any snow has fallen this winter. We could guarantee that on this property we would normally get over a winter up to eight falls a year and at least one of those would be somewhere around 18 inches to two feet. We're not seeing that now. Further south near Dunsandal, sheep and crop farmer Nigel Barnett says the council's drought report just confirms what he already knows. Well the bores are very low, they haven't recharged at all and the Selwyn River which is about, it's on our bottom boundary, um, it hasn't actually flowed probably for two years here so that's a suggestion to us as to how bad things are. Mr Barnett says with lambing season around the corner it will be difficult to feed all of his stock without irrigating. It's a worry knowing that the ground, that the water levels are so low. We came into this winter with no recharge from the last year and a lot of wells probably just continued to go down and without recharge they'll just continue to go down again and again and we'll get to the stage where pumps won't have the capacity to lift the water up and pressurise it. Irrigation New Zealand says the low groundwater levels means irrigating farmers need to ensure their equipment and irrigation schedules are up to scratch if they want to survive another dry summer. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Sally Murphy. Just days out from the start of the Rio Olympics. Yes, they are finally almost upon us. An emergency team of more than 600 people have been brought in to try to resolve issues inside the Olympic Village. With three days to go, in fact, the team is repairing everything from leaky pipes to missing shower heads, exposed wiring, missing doorknobs and blocked toilets. Our sports editor, Stephen Hewson, has arrived in Rio as a bit of an Olympics veteran. Well, how does the city's readiness compare to other Olympics he's attended? Well, this is the fourth Olympics I've been to, John, and it's uh, nothing quite like any of those. Uh, I mean, um, if uh, Rio was a couple of years out from, from these games, you'd say that they were, were going all right, but the fact they're a couple of days out, it just looks like everything's got a veneer. It's sort of, uh, there's certainly a rush to get last minute construction done. Um, many parts still look like a construction site, and there's just. Uh, yeah, a very much sort of a sense of unreadiness rather than preparedness for, for, for these games. Stephen, what about security and, of course, Zika, which everyone's talking about? Is there a general sense that Rio isn't that safe? There's, there's certainly a strong security presence around at places like the, the airports. When we arrived in, in, in Rio, there were um, sort of heavily armed soldiers around the, around the place, um, sort of every 10 metres or so, sort of patrolling around. Out on the streets, around the venues, um, there's certainly been a few army convoys floating floating around um, and also strong police presence as well. Um, there's all sorts of various forces that sort of, whether they're state, city or, or national, 
Um, they all seem to be sort of getting getting involved, and uh, you see a lot of very different uniforms around the place, but all all, all heavily armed. Um, I suppose health wise, uh, Zika. There was a lot of talk about that ahead of these games. Um, so far, I haven't seen a mosquito at all. So I mean, I'm not trying to belittle the situation, but it's the the, the Rio Mayor Eduardo Pay said ahead of these games that it was going to be winter time as it is here in Rio, but it's still sort of 23, 25 degrees. Uh, and he said Zika, we just don't see that as a problem in Rio. Dengue is a greater problem generally. Uh, in Brazil and, and Rio, and, and he to talk, talked about that. But as far as Zika goes, it doesn't seem to be uh, a, a factor at, at all for, for for locals, and it hasn't actually been a, much of a discussion point since we've been here for these last few days either. Uh, Stephen, one final question before you go: Has the team arrived? Is everyone representing New Zealand there? The bulk of them have. I mean, uh, as many of them that will be here are here in the sense numbers-wise. I mean, the 199 is that. Uh, total number of this team, but what's going to happen, people like Valerie Adams are only coming in and spending a couple of days, two or three days here, the same with the likes of Nick Willis. So they haven't arrived yet, but but total numbers-wise, as, as big as it, it gets, uh, and then sort of people will come and go over over the next couple of weeks when the, when the games finally get underway. Stephen Hewson, who is in Rio, one of the athletes who's already there and one of the first to compete is Kiwi Kayaker, Mike Dawson. He's in the canoe slalom. Mike funded his Olympic dream by publishing and selling his own cookbook made up of 22 of his favourite recipes. He told Stephen he had a good feel for the city already. Yeah, we've been fortunate enough uh, to be here off and on 10 weeks in the last five months, so got a good feel for the city, a good feel for the course which we're going to be racing on, which is a huge advantage for Luca and myself. Um, also got a chance to really meet a lot of the people around the city, see a few other things going on before the Olympics really got into full swing, so it's been quite eye-opening, quite a good experience and a, a lot of fun. And you've been involved in what a, a social program in the, in the favelas? Yeah, we've, uh, me and a buddy, we just decided that we wanted to give a little little back to those that don't really get too much of the whole Olympic um, spirit because they're obviously not from the environments that we're from. So we uh, we gave a bit of food out to a few people and made their day and tried to, you know, like just share a bit of the stoke of what we do and, and why we're here and leave a little mark on them. I don't know if it changed their day or their week, but they seem pretty happy. So what, what got you into that and what did you actually do? Yeah, it's a funny story because uh, in our hotel room we always cook a bit of food and I had a little bit of food left over so I just ran it out the front of the hotel to some guys, some young fellas, they're about 11 or 12 sleeping on the street and, and gave it to them and their face just lit up man and they just started wolfing it down and, and getting it in them as fast as they could so kind of got a little thought going inside my head that maybe we could do a little bit more for more people and obviously I've been really lucky to get here and have such an amazing support from New Zealand um, to support me, to help me financially get here as well so it's nice to give something back. Because you do a bit of cooking, don't you? You've got the, the recipe book, was, was yeah, your fundraiser? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I had a out of it fundraising, um, tried to think outside the box and had a cookbook and blown away by the amount of support from New Zealand, it's incredible and it, it motivates me and fires me up for the race day and, and because I'm that lucky it's nice to be able to share a bit of that with everyone else. Recipe wise, what were your, your specialties? Oh, for this project, um, actually we just uh, used our sports nutrition education that High Performance has helped us out with and put in a few of the core foods to help someone live for a week. So your yeah, carbohydrates, some things, some fruit, some uh, uh, milk, proteins, you know, that kind of stuff, just your staple, staple foods. Is that something you see a future for yourself in chefing? Chefing, I'd love to. I'd love to start a restaurant, cafe, but who knows, you know, I've got still a young fella, so I've got a lot of time left in the boat. It, it must be tough for you having to, to go through that, and maybe when you look at some of the other sports that are here in Rio, it, you must be a little envious as to the financial backing that they get. Not at all, you know, I, I love my sport, I don't do it for the money, I um, do it because I love the feeling of getting out on the water, I'm stoked when I have a good run, good feeling, good vibes, and um, if it was about the money it would be great that you don't have to worry about that, but at the same time it gives us so many opportunities, it means we have more flexibility, we get to train where we want to train, we have a good core training group and can kind of run our own program uh, rather than in the big teams that you don't really have that flexibility. Mike Dawson talking to Stephen Hewson.
Coming up on Checkpoint, prominent Māori leader Sanatata Love stands trial for fraudulently receiving $1.8 million in a deal to develop some central city land. The Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch report on Nauru. Uh, Victor Vito on his 100th and final game for the Hurricanes in their Super Rugby final showdown this weekend. And the Aussie couple who woke up to a giant sinkhole in their backyard. Nona is on one side of me to talk business in about two and a half minutes. But first, Katrina Batten with RNZ Headlines. The transport agency is rejecting criticism. It's been too slow to fix a stretch of road where five men were killed in a crash last night. Five Tongan workers died when their vehicle was hit by a logging truck as it pulled out onto State Highway 2. The transport agency's Tauranga Highway Manager, Nick Johansson, says it's the third most dangerous stretch of road in the country and millions have already been spent improving it. The judge has dismissed the jury in the rape trial of cricketer Scott Kugeline after it was unable to reach a verdict. Scott Kugeline was charged with raping a 21-year-old woman in May last year. The jury retired yesterday morning but returned to Hamilton District Court today telling the judge they would not be able to reach a unanimous or a majority verdict. Scott Kugeline has been remanded on bail until next month when a retrial date will be set. Otago University says it's likely to cut up to 20 academic jobs from its arts departments by the end of the year. The university's humanities division has lost more than 1,000 students in the past five years. The five departments facing cuts were confirmed today as history, English, music, languages and cultures and anthropology and archaeology. The university says education will face cuts next year and three other departments are on watch. Police dogs will be wearing new stab-proof harnesses from this week. The harnesses are designed to protect the dogs in the same way stab-proof vests protect officers, but without slowing the dog down. Ten dogs will wear the harnesses from this week, and the remaining 120 harnesses will be distributed over the next three months. Australia and New Zealand's Food Safety Authority is warning people to avoid eating rock melon because of a spike in salmonella cases associated with the fruit in Australia. The Ministry for Primary Industries is investigating whether any of the potentially contaminated fruit has been imported to New Zealand. Those are the headlines. I'll be back at six with more news, sport and weather. Thanks, Katrina. Coming up, what's going on in Nauru? It's bad and it's deliberate, Human Rights Watch says. But let's turn to business news now. With Nona Peltier, who is in the studio with us. Nona, we're buoyant sales figure. Sales figures. It's not just from Briscoe's, is it? It's from the Briscoe's Group, right? Yeah, Briscoe Group. It's a public listed company and it includes both Rebel Sport and Briscoe's, the homeware stores that people are more familiar with in terms of housewares and that kind of stuff. Anyway, yeah, the companies put out their second quarter sales figures, which are quite strong. So it's a reflection of the economy and, uh, the, you know, that people have a lot more money in their pocket than uh, they would have otherwise in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where we would have, you know... Um, high uh, inflation and so on. This is interesting because Patrick had the piece on before saying that actually rate, wages in real terms are going up at a miserably slow rate. Right. But because inflation is low, retail spending is a pretty accurate barometer of... That's right. Yeah, yeah. And also because our, our dollar is still... Yeah. quite high, a lot of the goods that we are buying in housewares and so forth. And these are big brands, right? Because Briscoe say that their sales are increasing because their market share is increasing because consumers like name brand products. Mm -hmm. So they like to buy, you know, Nike and what have you. They don't want to buy a no-name brand product. When they go to a houseware product a store, it's the same story. They want to buy, you know, Gordon Ramsay or... Jamie Oliver, whatever have you, and he, and he says that uh, it's it's a very good strategy for the company. So they're doing quite well. In fact, they're doing so well that they've increased. They've saying that their first half profit is going to be at least thirty two percent better than the year before. That's wow. the bottom wow. line. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Right, what do the markets do today? On well, uh, so of course, Briscoe Group's share price rose uh, nearly 3% uh, by $0.09 cents there to $3.36, which is really opposite to the way the direction of the market went today. It went down. I know the New Zealand market has been, you know, uh, near or above record highs for quite a while. However, the whole tone globally has kind of gone a bit off, and New Zealand is reflecting that. We've seen our local market fall 52 points. That's um, point, 0.7 percent 
down you know that's like uh, 7277 which is still, still pretty new, high yeah, and on the currency front we had a little bit of an impact from that wage data because it it shows that that it's very likely that the reserve bank will cut interest rates uh, next week and so our dollar is still trading around 72 cents us 94.8 Australian and 54 pence. Gosh, it's going to be fascinating to see what the Reserve Bank does and the reaction to it, isn't it? The wind's at next week. Next next week, yeah. yeah. I think on the 11th, so, Thank, yeah. Thanks, Nona. Nona Peltier in the studio with us in Auckland. It's 20 to 6. A court has been told the prominent Māori leader, Sanatata Love, corruptly sold his influence as a chairman of the Wellington Tents Trust. The 78-year-old is in trial in the Wellington High Court, charged with fraudulently receiving $1.8 million in a deal to, to develop some central city land. There's also an alternative charge of corruptly obtaining the money as a reward for favouring a particular business. Our court reporter Anne-Marie May filed this report. The Crown Prosecutor Grant Burston told the court Dr Love, who was chairman and a trustee of the Wellington Tents Trust, favoured the Equinox Redwood Consortium to develop a block of trust land in Pipitea Street in Wellington. In return, he and his partner Lorraine Skiffington were paid $1.5 million under a services agreement with the developers and a company associated with Ms Skiffington. Around $1.4 million of that was used to pay down a mortgage on a home owned by Dr Love and Ms Skiffington in Plymouthton, north of Wellington. Mr Burston said in October 2005 Dr Love introduced the developers to his son Martine Love and told them he was the person who would negotiate a joint venture. Various payments were made to Yellowstone, a company associated with Martine Love, but in an email he told the developers all correspondence should be sent to his father. Reference to Yellowstone also should be removed from correspondence. So for all tents and purposes, it is the Tata you are supposedly dealing with. Last year, Martin A. Love pleaded guilty to a charge over his part in the proposed property development, and in October he was sentenced to six months home detention. Mr Burston said an email sent by Lorraine Skiffington in September 2006 showed Dr Love facilitated her taking over the liaison role from his son. She referred to a meeting between the developers and Dr Love over that weekend, during which Dr Love had made it fairly clear that he wanted Ms Skiffington to be the interface between the developers and the tents. Ms Skiffington told the developers a consultancy fee would need to be decided on and an agreement was later signed under which they would pay $1.5 million to her company within seven days of it coming into effect. Ms Skiffington was also initially charged with fraud over her involvement in the property negotiations, but she is seriously ill and the charges against her were stayed in August last year. Mr Burston told the court major decisions about tense affairs are made collectively by its trustees and Dr Love had no power to make them without consultation. He also referred to Dr Love's actions when a letter from the developer's lawyers was inadvertently sent to the lawyer for the tense trust. Dr Love contacted the solicitor concerned saying that the services agreement was not to be released and it was confidential. He was upset and annoyed that it had been released. Ms Skiffington subsequently emailed the developer's solicitors asking for the services agreement to be never provided to third parties because it is a strictly confidential agreement. Mr Burston said Dr Love intended to deceive his fellow trustees and ultimately the beneficiaries of the Tents Trust. The trial is expected to run until the middle of August. For Checkpoint, Anne-Marie May. The government has U-turned on its decision not to fund safe sleep programs for newborns and will now be putting money towards it, but it won't say how much. The Ministry of Health came under fire last month for choosing not to invest $1.5 million in the program, which includes two types of sleeping devices. Eva Corlett reports. For some time, advocates have said pods reduce sudden unexpected death in infants, particularly for Māori, but the Ministry said it wanted proof. A safe sleeping advocate and professor in paediatrics, Ed Mitchell, says he presented his new research to the Minister of Health last week, and it makes a convincing argument for the programme. It's quite unique, really, that um, the reduction occurred um, within the Māori group, which is where the programme is uh, largely targeted, and in the uh, regions with the greatest distribution of pepipods. 
So these were the most active parts, and that's where the mortality was decreasing. Mr Mitchell expects the programme to cost around $1.5 million each year. That includes funding the pepe pods at a cost of $100 each and employing weavers to make wahakura. He says the initiative must be comprehensive. It needs to have a ability to identify the infants at risk. It needs an education program, which every family should, should receive. It needs a targeted use of the safe sleep devices, in other words, the wahakura or the pepe pod. Not every baby needs that, but we need to make sure it's appropriately targeted. A Māori safe sleep organisation says the programme should stay focused on Māori families because they are most at risk. The national manager of Whakawhetu, Catherine Clark, says a cluster of risk factors that contribute to sudden unexpected death in Māori infants is known, including higher smoking rates among parents and cultural practices of babies sleeping in the parents' bed. We still need to focus on making sure that the foodie rate continues to drop for Māori. We still have the highest foodie rate in the developed world, so we still need to have quite clearly a focus on Māori communities. Ms Clark says the government also needs to ensure there is a workforce who can provide antenatal support. A number of young women still have trouble accessing midwifery services, so we need to make sure that we've got antenatal programs that are appropriate for all ages and all ethnicity. And then, of course, we need to make sure that our young mums and babies are well taken care of. Ms Clark says distributing wahakura to families has resulted in decreased infant mortality rates. The Minister of Health, Dr Jonathan Coleman, was unavailable for comment. I tamaki makaurau mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi. Ko Iva Colette tēnei. It's uh, 13 and a half minutes to six. We've got some sad news to hand. A statement from Chris Amon's family, the famous Kiwi motor racer, of course. Chris has died uh, just past his 73rd birthday, his family have just uh, announced in a statement. We will be talking to someone about Chris and his legacy and everything he did in a wonderful life before six o'clock. But we turn now to Nauru, where, according to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, the 1,200 people forcibly transferred and detained there are being subjected to inhumane treatment, sexual harassment, the denial of medical care, crowded and filthy conditions and a campaign of abuse. This is a deliberate strategy by the Australian government, according to both organisations organisations explicitly designed to discourage refugees from trying to reach Australia by boat. Elaine Pearson is Australian Director for Human Rights Watch. She hopes the report provokes the Australian people into anger over what's happening in Nauru because the Australian government simply isn't backing down. No, I mean, it's incredibly shameful, I think, that you know people are, in fact, setting themselves on fire, um, people are swallowing razor blades, um, popping pills um, in order to end their lives. They would rather do that um, than remain in these conditions. Every single person that we spoke to um, described um, either being intimidated, um, being subjected to acts of violence or facing harassment uh, by locals. Many told us how they had rocks thrown at their homes. They live in sort of container-like accommodation and it's somewhat ghettoised from where the locals live. And I think, look, this policy has been bad decision after bad decision. And, um, you know, it's time for the Australian people, I think, really to, yeah, to take a long, hard look at the human cost of these policies and demand more um, from Australian politicians. Because, you know, the the sad thing is that um, these policies of offshore detention and processing um, have bipartisan support in Australia. Um, so, you know, I think it's really up to the people of Australia to, to shame the politicians and say enough is enough. Uh, we need to offer some kind of alternative for, for these people in these conditions. You describe severe abuse, inhumane treatment and neglect, and yet there is no plan B for these people, is there? There is nothing they can do in response to this. There isn't. And I mean, this is part of the problem is there's been so much uncertainty. When people first arrived on Nauru more than three years ago, they were told, you're going to be here for up to five years. This is just for processing. Um, and then since then, the story's changed. Um, and it's very unclear what will happen to these people long term. Now, Ru has certainly said that they will not offer permanent residency to these people. Australia continually says they won't come to Australia. Um, and so, you know, people who've already suffered a lot in their home countries, many of whom have been persecuted or tortured, um, you know, are, are facing a, a life in limbo. 
um, as a result. And really, we need to find some kind of effective um, options for these people. 77% of them have been found to be genuine refugees. The time on Checkpoint is uh, just coming up to 10 minutes to 6. Kiwi motorsport legend Chris Amon has died aged 73 in Rotorua Hospital. Chris battled cancer in recent years but retained not only a close interest in Formula One and his very wide range of favourite topics but also his wonderful sense of humour complete with infectious chuckle, we are told. Alan Dick, a motorsport journalist of 50 years who knew Chris well, is joining us on the phone, I think. Alan, are you there? Yes, I am, John. Hi, Alan. Lo lovely to talk to you. I'm, I'm sorry it's in these circumstances. What, what, what a wonderful fellow Chris Amon was. John, he was, he was, was without doubt the greatest motor racing driver this country has ever produced. That's a, that's a big thing, isn't it? He really was, was he? Yes, he was. He had more natural talent than perhaps Bruce McLaren and uh, Dennis Holm to get put together. Wow. Uh, you could say that perhaps he... In some ways, he, you could almost say that he wasted his talent by making wrong decisions at the wrong time. Yeah, well, teams. He was really unlucky with his teams, wasn't he? He had major breakdown issues, didn't he, early on in his career? Yes. I mean, when he, when he, signed, when he signed for Ferrari in 1967, everybody thought, wow. But then Ferrari was going through a very, very lean season, and uh, he got disgruntled and he got, dis uh, he got dis disillusioned. So he went to a new team called March who were promising him all sorts of things. They never, they, they never produced a... Oh, bugger. We've lost Alan, I think. We'll try and get Alan back. He was an extraordinary character, Chris Amon. Um, our older listeners, everyone sort of my age and older, will absolutely remember him if you grew up in New Zealand. I was just looking on his wiki page since news came out of Chris's death, age 73, from cancer. This has just been announced by his family in the last hour or so. He's widely regarded to be one of the best F1 drivers never to win a championship Grand Prix. His reputation for bad luck was such that fellow driver Mario Andretti, famously, of course, once joked that if he became an undertaker, people would stop dying. So he really was cursed, I think, as Alan said. And Alan, you're back, aren't you, by just terrible luck I I early on in his career with team choices, right? Yes, yes, he had, he had it all at his feet. Uh, and the moment that he, left, that he left Ferrari to go for this unknown quantity called March, uh, really his career went under hold. From that point on, he made bad choice after bad choice. But, John, let me tell you that Today, a racing driver, a Formula One driver at 18 or 19 is not so remarkable. Back then in 1963, yeah. 64, was absolutely unheard of. Chris Amon, uh, just virtually out of high school, uh, obviously had some money behind him. Uh, he bought a, a 1954 250F Maserati, a front-engine Grand Prix car, and he took it to the International Motor, motor Race meeting at Levin. And he was spotted by a legendary race driver and team manager called Reg Parnell. Reg Parnell could not believe what he saw. He saw this fresh-faced young kid driving a 250 Ave Maserati like nobody had ever driven one before. And one year later, he sent Chris a telegram saying, catch the next aeroplane, you're driving oh, Formula great, One next weekend. Great a story. story. Great story. You, you, Alan, you've been uh, you, you're sort of lifelong buddies, I guess, mates. You certainly knew each other well. You, have you spoken to Chris in the last wee while? Yes, I spoke to him. I did a story in the latest issue of Classic Driver uh, marking the 50th anniversary of the 24-hour race at Le Mans. Yeah, that's right. And Bruce McLaren That's right, won. they won. They won it, didn't they? Yes, and they won it. It had always been a bit doubtful about how they won it. And uh, for, for 50 years, really, the world has believed that it was a dead heat. In fact, it wasn't a dead heat. Chris and Bruce won by something like about four metres, so it was quite a, quite a clear success. <laughs> but, um, I mean, he, he really wanted... He was invited to go back because it was a big, big deal for the Ford Motor Company. But he couldn't go. He didn't. And he was quite open about his illness, I've got to say. When I spoke to him, there was no holding back. He told me what was wrong with him. He told me what, what had been done to him. He told me the treatment. Uh, and he didn't tell me the expectation. So yeah. there we are. He, he, I, I suspect that he knew, though. Yeah. Alan, thanks for joining us, and I'm, I'm really My pleasure, John. I'm sorry, uh, oh, Alan. Just before you go, we, yeah. we we lost you. We lost your phone line before. Was that because of the weather? Is it really? Are you in Oamaru? Is it really foul there? Yes, it's been it's been foul all day. Cold and rainy. Uh, no snow here, but we've had no snow. But there's no wind. But there's a lot of rain. 
Oh. Well, they look, they need that a bit further north, don't they, in the Canterbury farming area. But thanks so much, Alan. It's lovely to talk to you as always. Alan Dick, Chris Amon's mate, and of course, uh, a motor journalist for probably 50 years or more. Um, what are we going to now? We are going to the sinkhole. An Australian couple who lost their belongings in the 2011 Brisbane floods are counting themselves lucky after a giant sinkhole opened up in their backyard. I'm not sure how that's luck. Engineers and a mining company have spent the past day at the home of Ipswich pensioners Lynn and Ray Mackay after a 100 metre deep sinkhole full of water opened up near Lynn's clothesline. And the clothesline is material in this. This afternoon, Lynn told me how the last 24 hours have unfolded. 9am yesterday morning, being what Tuesday morning, our neighbour was out in his yard and he heard this big bang and he turned around and he was this hole in our backyard. And he came and said to us, do you know you have a hole in your backyard? And we said no. And we looked out the window and boy, could we see a hole? But it's, oh, I don't know how... I can't remember now how how how, yeah, yeah. how big how big the hole is. It's big. About this big, ten by thirteen or twelve by fourteen or something. And it's getting bigger, Lynn, is it? Well, no, I think it's stopped now. The the uh, mines department are pumping the water out, so then they can see where they go from there, what's going on underneath. So does anyone have any idea what's going on underneath? Because there's been some mining in the area and there's been yes. flooding in the area, so anything's Nine possible. Years ago, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but, but people are looking after you, Lynn. I see the mayor turned up and he took it. Oh, the mayor, the, our mayor, no, mayor, mayor Paul, he's really wonderful. Is he? He's doing all he possibly can. And uh, seeing that we've got accommodation, and seeing that we've got meals and things, you know, so he has been really, really wonderful. But how long so how... have all the other councillors and everyone else been involved? And also the neighbours. Yeah, they but, yeah, but you, it's, Ipswich is a small community, right? And 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 you well, um you, you and Ray have been there for how long? How long have you lived there for? Twenty five years. Yeah. So you're part of the furniture in that neighbourhood, oh, yeah. aren't you? Yes, yeah. We're part of the furniture. So, yeah. And so what are you going to do, Lynn? Can you live there? You, it... uh, we'll be able to live here once they get it all sorted out. I, I, we're not allowed out the back to find out, but uh, everyone's been tell, telling us this and that and something else. But, um, you know, I, I'm not real sure what, what the real go is at the present. Um, so we're just playing things by ear and hearing, hearing what's, um, what everyone else is telling us. Yeah, well, you need to wait to have those checks done and see if the land uh, is stable yeah, and all well, that. We're doing the checks and the uh, mines department are uh, pumping this big hole out with water. In the, in the meantime, I, I, w I wouldn't use your clothesline for the time being. That's a bit precarious <laughs> now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't want them to take me clothesline. I don't want. No, it won't. I don't think it'll get to the clothesline. Not that far from the clothesline. It's really. a state-of-the-art clothesline. You, you'd want to keep that. It is. It is. Yes. I said that's one thing I want to say because you cannot buy the old Hills Rotary clothes horse. <laughs> Lynn Mackay. Uh, we, uh, I was talking to Lynn this afternoon. After she finished, after we finished, we did branch off to quite a long discussion. Katrina Batten. What's that close line called? That one? It, it's a hill's hoist. Right. And so when when you and I were growing up, people had them in their back... Well, when I was growing up, I'm oh, demonstrably older than you. People had them in their backyards. You'd walk down the concrete path. Yeah. There they'd be in the middle of the lawn. Yeah, and then they could rise it up. It yeah, could go up right. and down. Oh, yeah. They were featured as a thing <laughs> of the Australian uh, Sydney Games in the 2000s. They, in the oh, opening ceremony, they, they had hill's be. hoists. Yeah, as they should be, and you could stand there and spin them around and put your. She could still use that yeah, she, line. Yeah. She'd just stand at one end, and yeah, then she could you just could turn spin it. it yeah.
So do you ever go near and, the hole? And I grew up in Wellington, and in a gale, the old clothesline would just go round and round like the merry-go-round right. at, the, at the circus. Yes. Okay, Katrina Batten, um, uh, sorry, the time on Checkpoint is uh, 45 seconds for the news, so I'm going to tell you what's coming up after the news, and then we can go straight into the news okay. after the pip. Uh, uh, after the pips, we are going to talk to Victor Vito. We were going to talk to him before six, but we... Um, we had the breaking news about Chris Amon and we spoke to Ellen Dick who gave a delightful insight into him, I think. Victor Vito is playing his 100th and final game for the Hurricanes this Saturday and it happens to be the final of the Super Rugby competition. We're also going back, of course, to Katikato where they are mourning the death of five Tongan call store workers and we're going to talk to a man who knew them, who was an elder in the church they went to, one of them was living with and was a volunteer fireman who went along to the call out and found it was his mates. That interview will be coming up after six. Kia ora everyone, you are with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Thank you for joining us however you are doing so, whether it's on the radio, Freeview Channel 50 or live streaming on the RNZ website. It's six o'clock and that is time for the news with Katrina Batten. Ngā mihi nui, good evening. The Crown says three people managed to feed and look after themselves while they left an elderly woman to starve to death in her bedroom. The prosecutor has summed up the case against Cindy Taylor, who's accused of the manslaughter of her mother, Ina Dung, by failing to provide her with food, water and medical attention. Edward Gay reports from the High Court in Auckland. Cindy Taylor's flatmates Luana and Brian Taylor are charged with failing to get Ms Dung help despite knowing she was in danger. The prosecutor Natalie Walker told the court there was food in the cupboards and fridge and cleaning products around the house, but Ms Dung was left with broken ribs, chemical burns from her own waist and ulcers which were turning gangrenous. She said Cindy Taylor should have called 111 or taken her mother to hospital, but instead she spent more time at work. Miss Walker said everyone living in the three-bedroom home would have heard, smelled and seen that Miss Dung was in danger. Ko Edward Gay, TNA, atu i te koti matua. The Transport Agency is rejecting criticism it's been too slow to fix a stretch of road where five men were killed in a crash last night. Five Dongan men died when their vehicle was hit by a logging truck as they were pulling out onto State Highway 2. Kati Kati residents say they've been battling for years to have the road made safer. The Transport Agency's Tauranga Highway Manager, Nick Johansson, says it's the third most dangerous stretch of road in the country, but millions have already been spent on it. He says it's a very tricky stretch of road to quickly make improvements on. Two human rights groups say Australia is ignoring the inhuman in a report released today, the agencies say they've been deliberately blocked from investigating the situation on Nauru. The ABC's Lexi Metherill reports. The joint report by Amnesty and Human Rights Watch details what's now a familiar series of concerns about mental health, access to adequate medical care, attacks on refugees and asylum seekers from the local Nauruan population and concerns for the education and health of the 49 children still on the island. They spoke to more than 80 of the 1,200 people transferred to Nauru after seeking asylum in Australia. The organisations say the report will now be used as part of a global campaign. Lexi Metherall with that report. One union is warning workers are increasingly prepared to take strike action in the face of shrinking pay offers. Official figures show annual wage increases eased to 1.5% in the year to June and have now been below 2% for the last four years. The Assistant Secretary at Unite Union, Tom Buckley, says employers could pay but won't. He says with rates, rents and energy bills marching ever higher, struggling employees are demanding their fair share. Where this is happening, I think on many occasions we've seen an increasing amount of it. Workers are um, wanting more and they're actually prepared to... Um, take the step to industrial action where needed to ensure that the wage increases can improve. Tom Buckley says two strike ballots have been taken by Unite Workers in the last couple of weeks because the offers were not enough. The Waimakariri District Council says turning some of its earthquake damaged red zone land into farmland will leave options open for the future. The council has completed a draft plan for the almost 100 hectares of red zoned land and passed it to the minister supporting Greater Christchurch Regeneration, Jerry Brownlee. 
The council's earthquake recovery manager, Simon Markham, says under the plan, large areas could be used for parks and recreation and some for low-intensity farms. There may well be enhancements to land remediation technology and the costs of that come down to the point where a wider range of future use involving build outcomes becomes feasible. Simon Markham says the plans also proposes rezoning some land to allow for the possible, the possible expansion of the Kaiapoi Town Centre. The plan is out for public consultation. The Dental Association is reviewing its guidelines after the US dropped its recommendation people floss every day. The latest guidelines issued by the US Departments of Agriculture and Health and Human Services have dropped any mention of flossing. A Dental Association spokesman, Warwick Duncan, says the change appears to be a res in response to a report which found the evidence for flossing was weak. Mr Duncan, a professor of periodontology at Otago University, says a lot of the research on flossing is not robust. However, he says there is good evidence that removing bacteria from between teeth helps prevent gum disease. Police dogs will start wearing stab-proof vests this week. Ten dogs will wear the vests from this week and the rest will be distributed over the next three months. The harnesses were designed by a Hamilton-based company. In sport, Australian code hopper Jared Haynes' return to the NRL has been met with contempt at his old club. Haynes signed, had signed a lifetime deal with the Parramatta Eels when he left rugby league at the end of 2014 to pursue a career in American football. Following his brief stint with the NFL and with the Fijian Sevens team, Hayne announced today he signed a two-year, multi-million dollar deal with the Gold Coast Titans. Haynes says he waited for an offer from Parramatta, but it never came. However, Parramatta says it offered a substantial deal, but Haynes management says it wasn't comparable with other proposals. The first New Zealand athletes take centre stage at the Olympic Games in Rio tomorrow when the football ferns kick off their campaign against the world number one, the United States. Their coach Tony Redding says they have genuine hopes of going far. We've had some success on the world stage. Over the last four years I think you know, a lot of people around the world would know a lot more about our team. We don't fly in under the radar anymore, we're not the dark horses like we used to be. We, we play regularly against the top teams in the world, so when teams look at us, they'll see a team that's full of very, very talented players across the pitch. Tomorrow morning's game kicks off at 10. And the former New Zealand Formula One driver Chris Amon has died aged 73. Amon was most famous for his victory in the 1966 Le Mans 24-hour endurance race alongside Bruce McLaren. That's the news. A community in mourning. The situation is that Kitty Cat's in total shock. These people have been part of the community for a considerable period of time. A political minefield. Well, I think they've actually taken some lessons from uh, Donald Trump. A compensation conundrum. To me, that's a pretty much a tacit acknowledgement that something went wrong in that process. Because the government just doesn't give away money for things for no reason. Morning Report. Guy and Espiner and Susie Ferguson. Weekdays from 6. Then on Nine to Noon, how tourism in Thailand is fueling the cruel treatment of tigers. And after 10, cross-cultural and political psychologist Professor James Liu on just what is our national character. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on Nine to Noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. Met service weather to midnight tomorrow and snow warnings are in force for some parts of the South Island. In the west, from Northland to Wellington, including Coromandel and the central high country, showers turning to rain at times with some heavy falls, snow lowering to 700 metres about the central high country tomorrow. Bay of Plenty showers, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa rain at times, snow lowering to 600 metres in the south tomorrow. Nelson and Buller showers and snow lowering to 500 metres, clearing tomorrow. Westland and Fiordland showers with snow lowering to low levels in the south, clearing tonight. Marlborough, Canterbury, Otago and Southland, rain south of Christchurch, spreading north overnight, falling as snow to low levels, gradually easing tomorrow and clearing from inland areas of Otago and Southland. The Chatham Islands, rain at times. It's eight and a half past six. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. The Kati Kati community in the Bay of Plenty is in shock after the deaths of five Tongan men who worked at the local kiwi fruit call store. The men were killed after their car was hit by an unladen logging truck as they left work last night. Community members gathered today along with staff at the call store to mourn their loss together. Dara Stewart has more. 
Staff at Aonga Tete Cool Stores placed flowers this morning at the crash site, which was followed by a blessing and cleansing ceremony at the pack house. The pack house was the last place where most of the staff saw the five victims, and manager Clive Exelby says there's been a tremendous outpouring of grief. At 8 o'clock last night we finished work uh, packing kiwi fruit and, and by quarter past eight we no longer had these uh, five men working for us. Mr Exelby recruited the young men from Donga himself and said they were well respected by staff and within the community. He says two of the victims, father and son Sitiveni and Koli Vaipulu, were supposed to travel home on the work bus but changed their plans at the last minute. They were very well liked. They, they're very jovial. They loved playing tricks on one another and joking with one another. And that was one of the things they did last night. The last things they did was instead of going to the bus, they ran into the car park because Helene was offering them a ride and they joked with the other Tongan men that, ha ha, you didn't get a ride, we got a ride. Mr Exelby says Sitiveni Vaipulu played a pivotal role in the company and had worked for them for the last eight years. Sifita Hauli, the registered seasonal employer coordinator for Tongans in New Zealand under the scheme, says the workers were just nearing the end of their contract. One of them was here for the very first time this season. The other... Two were here for over two years, but one of the senior members of the, uh, this group has been here since 2007. He's been here every year since the start of the RSE work program. Clive Exelby says they were due to go home in about two weeks. Well, yesterday I'd actually um, had just had confirmed their air tickets to go back home. So we just booked those tickets and had them confirmed and they were... It was excitement looking forward to uh, uh, getting back to their families. After consultation among workers this morning, a fellow RSC worker, Apolosi Tuangalo, says they've now all decided to return home early. We are heartbroken at what has happened. We really feel the loss of our colleagues. We met this morning and we've all decided we want to return together with our colleagues who died. We'll just come back next year. We all just feel that we want to return together and take them home. Sefita Hauli says the RSC workers were insured under the scheme, which will cover the repatriation costs of the victims' bodies. For Checkpoint, Indira Stewart. Simeone Vakasio Ola is a Tongan church elder in Katikati. One of the victims, Halani Fine, was living with him. But he's also a volunteer firefighter, and last night he was called out to the accident, not knowing who was in it or what he'd see. John, I saw something that I, want, I didn't want to see, um, something that I didn't expect to see when I became a firefighter. Uh, it's probably the worst nightmare for a fire, firefighter to respond to a call out and see what I saw last night. Um, some, some, some people that we know. Yeah, it, it must have been the most terrible thing. And one mm. of them, Halani, lives with you, lived with you, was in your home, part yes. of your family. Um, Halani was a good friend of ours. Uh, he was a missionary uh, around the Pacific. He was a very talented man. Uh, he was uh, in Kirikiri because he wanted to study to be a youth counsellor at the Bethlehem Institute of Technology, which is a, uh, a Bible-based college. Uh, he had that desire to work and help the youth out. Um, uh, because of that, he find his, he find his way down to Kirikiri, living with us uh, while he had a family um, up in Auckland. Uh, but he was a very... Uh, active member of the Karikari youth and he was the leader uh, of our youth group as well so we'll, we will miss him. So he was working at the packing house to raise money to pay for his studies and living with you and your family while he was studying and last night I know you had the terrible exactly. task of calling his family to tell them what had happened? Yes. Um, I feel that it is, it is my responsibility to 
to drain his mother and tell him. Um, it's probably the hardest thing that I have ever done in my life to just to say the word to a mother that his son has uh, uh, move on. Yeah, Simeone, it's truly terrible. And to the other families mm. who were who back in Tonga and who have lost their sons and husbands and brothers in these circumstances, it's just it's yes. heartbreaking for entire communities, isn't it? It is very sad for the whole Tongan community. And for the people of Tonga who have heard the news, I am pretty sure that they feel the pain just as we are now. Simeone, I had no idea that the community of, of Tongan seasonal workers was so big in the Katikat area. It seems that there's, you know, 20, 30, 40 uh, uh, Tongan workers there and that many of them return year after year after year and they're very much part of your church, are they? Yes, they are. They are. Um, it is bigger, uh, that, that number. I think uh, at the whole of Katikati, they... The seasonal workers' community is over a hundred, so they are very, very big part of our community while they are in New Zealand. Simeone Vakasio Ola, who is the Tongan church elder in Katikati, who knew the men well. In fact, one of them, Halani, was living with him. It's quarter past six. Four people lived at 41 Moncrief Ave in Clendon, Auckland, where there was food in the cupboards, not to mention a washing machine and cleaning products in the bathroom. But while three of the residents were able to feed, clothe and clean themselves, the fourth starved to death in her bedroom at the end of the hallway. Ina Dong was found lying in her own waist on a green plastic sheet weighing just 29 kilograms. Her daughter Cindy Taylor has been charged with her manslaughter while her fat mates and friends Brian and Luana Taylor have been charged with failing to get the 76 year old help despite knowing she was in danger. Our Auckland court reporter Edward Gay filed this report. In her closing address to the jury the Crown Prosecutor Natalie Walker said the three defendants shared a small three bedroom house with one bathroom. All of them would have seen, heard and smelled Miss Dung's suffering. She said Miss Dung's death is a story of neglect and in the end the elderly woman starved to death. Miss Dung's shocking weight, 29 kilograms, her emaciated state, the protruding bones are all evidence from which you can be sure that she failed to provide her mother with nourishment. Miss Walker said Cindy Taylor also failed to provide her mother with basic nursing care. There were no clean sheets or clothes and no regular baths. She had skin tears, visible blood, pus, open exposed sores. There were no signs of antiseptic, disinfectant, creams, plasters, bandages. These were all open sites for infection on her mother. In a hot New Zealand summer, as she lay on her own waist on a plastic sheet. Miss Walker said Miss Dung also had 14 broken ribs and a broken breastbone that required immediate medical attention, but instead Cindy Taylor put her in bed. She said the pain would have been so severe Miss Dung would have struggled to move or even breathe. To illustrate the pain, Miss Walker pointed to the injury suffered by the Hurricanes captain, Dane Coles. Rugby fans amongst you may have recently seen Dane Coles, the 108 kg hooker in all black, leaving the field in, in agony after what was described as an injury uh, to his rib cartilage, so not even a fractured rib. And that was during the quarterfinal win over the Sharks, and that injury, which wasn't a fracture, um, and certainly wasn't 14 fractured ribs and a fractured sternum, left that hard man of the All Blacks out of the rest of the match. Miss Walker said there was no emergency call while Miss Dung was alive, no trips to the hospital or doctors, and rather than take time off work to look after her mother, Miss Taylor increased her hours. She said the case was one of the worst examples of neglect. In Cindy Taylor's defence, her lawyer Peter Kay said his client's life was similar to that of the tale of Cinderella and the Ugly Sisters. He said Miss Taylor was working long hours on night shift, only to come home to clean the house and care for her mother, snatching sleep when she could. This woman is living a life, I suggest, of hell. Nothing short of living hell, Mr Foreman. What a life for anybody. He told the jurors that his client had been criticised for a number of things by the Crown, but the jurors had to judge her as a human being. There are 12 of you. It's a reasonable person, not with the benefit of hindsight, not some sort of perfect robot type person, but a reasonable person. 
Mr Kay's closing address was cut short when a juror fell ill and the court had to retire for the day. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi ko Edward Gay TNA. 90 minutes past six earlier in Checkpoint, news of Chris Amon dying aged 73. Well, the world of Māori performing arts is mourning the death of kapahaka expert Ngāpō Wehi. Dr Wehi set up the Auckland-based haka group Te Wakahuia in 1983 who have won the National Kapahaka Championship title five times. Te Manu Kōrahi reporter Shannon Honui-Thompson has more about the man many are calling the godfather of kapahaka. <laughs> is Wakahuya performing the action song Te Wahine Toa in Ngaru Wahia in 1992 at the Aotearoa Festival. This is only one of the many now classic songs Ngā Wehe composed with his wife Pimea, also known as Nen. His kapa haka legacy started with the East Coast haka group Waihirere in the 1950s. Then in the 70s, he and his wife Pimea became the tutors of Waihirere and won the national title twice. This is Ngāpō Wehe talking to Henare Te Ua and remembering composing a poi song and actions in one week. Well, as you know that Nen and I work as a team. And it even goes a bit further than that, even our children, our whole house, they are involved, whether it be singing, a guitar, or poi. Mm. The whole family's involved. The hardest part about composing and I don't see ourselves as composers, so we are sort of uh, uh, names and more musical than I am. <clears throat> and I'm inclined to chant and haka. And of course, uh, we have to uh, try and get a fairly balanced, you can have an outstanding haka, and you may be let down to the action song. Willie Tiaho, a current member of Waihi Dede, says Ngāpō and his wife Nen were very humble, but had a strong purpose. And everything that he did was about humility. Everything that he did was written in his uh, songs that he composed with uh, Auntie uh, Pimea Wehi. And uh, what they highlighted was uh, the strength in our culture, the strength in our language, the strength in tapahaka, and using those as fundamental elements uh, for a well-balanced Māori to progress in this world. This is Mr Wehi speaking in 1972 at the award ceremony for the Aotearoa Festival when Waihi Rere won for the first time. And to even look into the distance, and what do I see? My Māori tanga in a state of collapse? Beware, young men, young women, lest the heritage, the sanctity, the dignity of your race should descend with our ancestors into the bowels of the earth and become unretrievable. Willie Tiaho says all the songs he composed were memorable. When you go back to 1972 and you look at the songs that he composed, the likes of Nga Te Mea, which was a cry for us to learn our Māori language, uh, Mana Wahine, uh, composed with uh, Auntie Pimea, and uh, if I go back to 1986, when they first won with uh, Te Waka Hoia, you know, uh, people said that his haka at that time uh, was considered uh, contemporary. Uh, now, uh, 30 years later, it's considered a classic. <laughs> Ngā Pōwehi's funeral will be held this Thursday at Pārihi Mānehi Marae in the east coast town of Waihirere. Moi mai rā e te rangatira. Te hōtaka o te ahi-ahi, ko Shannon Hainui-Thompson tēnei. Kia ora, Shannon.
Only three seeps to go. I appreciate that some of you may not be as excited about that as I am, but if you're a Hurricanes rugby fan, this Saturday night will be pretty special. The Hurricanes are the only New Zealand team, lest we forget, never to have won the Super Rugby competition. The Crusaders have won it seven times. Yes, you heard that correctly. The Blues have won it three times, the Chiefs twice, and the Highlanders once against the Hurricanes last year. This Saturday, the Hurricanes play the Lions in the 2016 final. The Lions are a South African team in magnificent form who've also never won the competition. And for Kane's loose forward, Victor Vitor, the final will not only be a grand occasion in itself, it will also be his 100th Super Rugby game and his final game for the Hurricanes. <laughs> nah, not not could it be much bigger really uh, in terms of your career and um, yeah, I just I'm just excited really to get the, get an opportunity really to run out with the lads again one more time. Obviously for my career and um, hopefully to win. You so run out one more time. Had you lost on Saturday night, of course you would have been stranded on 99 Super Games forever. Yes, 99 Super Games forever, or just go to France and try to play as much as I can and then try to come back one more time, but. By that time, I'll be an old man, so I don't know if the Hurricanes would have me back. How old are you, Victor? <laughs> I'm 29. Are you? Yes, so we're we way off being elderly. Of course, oh, yeah, we way off. Yeah, you scored a in rather wonderful terms, try. No, What's that? In rugby terms, that's an old man. Oh, though, so. nonsense. You scored a wonderful try off the back of the scrum on Saturday night with TJ taking off as if you were going to pass it to the open and you went the blind. That must have been a wonderful moment. Yeah, it was a good moment to just see that um, there was no one there, really. Um, you can practice <laughs> things all you like, but um, if uh, the picture doesn't eventuate and someone else is there, then, um, yeah, the, the try might not have happened that way. But, no, always always happy to dot down, especially in front of your home fence. Yeah. How Does it feel different this season than last season going into the final? Because last season th there were lots of big farewells and, and the Hurricanes were overwhelming favourites and I think the Highlanders had been mistakenly underrated. But, you, you know, you were saying goodbye to Ma'a and Corey and so many of the players were off. Do, are you going into this with slightly less weight on your shoulders? Yeah, I think we're going in with, uh, with uh, a lot more open eyes, I guess, in terms of, you know, we've... We've learned, obviously, from what happened last year and the devastation there was uh, the game that we lost. But um, at the same time, you, if, you, if you don't see the learnings, then we're now back in this position again. Um, the boys, if anything, we're just trying not to bite, in, bite into the hype. Obviously, it's a big occasion, but we can't get past the fact that, you know, if anything, we're underdogs and we haven't won anything in our history. So we're just holding on to that and making sure that we do the business that, like we have been trying to do all year. Yeah, it's a funny one, this one, isn't it? Because no, no one really knows how good the Lions are going to be. Uh, but you have to say, having watched both games, and I'm sure you have too, you know, that was a convincing win over the Highlanders and they really trounced a good Crusaders team. Yeah, um, you know, we, we are under no illusion as to the threat that the Lions bring. Um, you know, they're, they're a bit of an anomaly, really, in, in African rugby. They, they've got backs that play like New Zealand backs, but then also the forwards that mind throwing the ball around as well. But they've also got that African thing with their drive and the big lads and whatnot. So they've got a bit of everything. So for us, we've got a handful. Yeah, you have. Who's going to... Who's, do, do you know if Dane's playing on Saturday night, Dane Coles? Well, we're not sure yet. Um, obviously, he didn't play in the weekend, and we're just going to give him pretty much day-by-day -day analysis and see how he goes. And, and how's TJ going as skipper behind you? Is he, is he talking a lot of nonsense? Uh, you know, he's, he's pretty straight these days, TJ. He's very focused on making sure we get to where we want to. So, um, uh, look, he, he has a, a bit of a laugh every now and then, but it's very, very, very few and far between. You've suddenly become the oldest statesman of Wellington rugby, you and TJ and Bowden. <laughs> yeah, still, I mean, still in your 20s. You, you know, this mantle yeah. has been... And uh, you will look the part, Victor. Yeah, well, um, oh, like I was saying, in rugby, 29 is a bit ancient. But, uh, yeah, I think it's just the way the game's going and it's been... It's been pretty good being able to still put up some, some decent rugby with all these 19 and 20 year olds knocking on the door. So, yeah, no, nah, it's good. It's always good to be part of the, the Hurricanes family and see that some younger guys are coming through because they're all putting their hands up at the moment. And that's the main thing. Yeah, it's exciting to see. You're off to La Rochelle. So you're, 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 you're moving with the family to France? Yes, I'm moving with the whole family, just pretty much my wife, my son, and then obviously our, our uh, next, next one who's a little boy during October. Well, good luck, Victor. Good luck with the fatherhood, which is obviously, you know, the most important thing you'll do, and uh, and, and with the rugby both on Saturday and in France. And th and thank you for wonderful service, both with the Canes and the All Blacks. Thanks, JC, mate. Thanks a lot.
Victor Vito, who truly is a delightful man, a wonderful rugby player, 33 games for the All Blacks. Had the great misfortune, of course, of trying to get into the All Blacks at the time that uh, Richie McCaw and Kieran Reid and people like that were in the loose. A hundred games for the Hurricanes. A lovely email coming in uh, from Christine. Thank you so much for your thoughtful and sensitive coverage of the tragedy that's happened in Kati Kati, where Christine has emailed us from. We are all shocked and feel for those families and the whole community. Everyone will be affected. We also have large Vanuatu and Solomon Islands communities here during the winter. It adds so much colour and vitality to our town. And like the response when the cyclone hit Vanuatu, the community will respond and help, I'm sure. What a lovely email, Christine. Uh, yes, we were talking to, um, we was, I think we were all a bit taken aback by the size of the Tongan community in the seasonal workforce in the Kati Kati area. And the uh, church elder we were talking to says as many as 100 people come from Tonga to work for up to seven months. They come back season after season, year after year, and they become part of the community and part of the life of the Kati Kati area and the Bay of Plenty area. Uh, terrible tragedy, five lives lost last night. That's Checkpoint for tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll be back at five o'clock tomorrow. Until then, ka kite ano and a very good evening indeed. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. Final arguments have been made in the case of Cindy Taylor, who's accused of killing her mother by failing to provide her with food, water and medical attention. The transport agency rejects that it's been too slow to fix a stretch of Bay of Plenty Road where five men were killed in a crash last night. The Dental Association is reviewing its guidelines after the United States dropped its recommendation for people to floss every day. And the former New Zealand Formula One driver Chris Amon has died. Our next news and weather is at seven. You know, the word bullying comes from bulls. This week, Country Life's out shopping for a bull. He's got particularly nice rounded bum. He's got a nice head and jaw. Good temperament, good feet, nice sized nuts. Very good behind on it, good straight back. A lot of things that uh, make a good bull, yeah. Country Life, Friday nights at 9 and Saturday mornings after 7 on RNZ.